We are? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Okay. Welcome to our very first Frontline Google Hangout. I'm Patrice Tedonio. I work on the audience team here at Frontline. And last night, uh, hopefully many of you watched as we premiered Growing Up Trans. It's a new documentary that's a really deep look at the struggles and choices that kids who feel like they were born in the wrong body and their families are facing. And more medical options are available to transgender kids than ever before, but these are not easy decisions and this field of medicine is very new and in many ways uncharted. So what does all of this mean? Uh, we, we got a taste with the documentary uh, that aired last night on Frontline and now I'm excited to be here to help moderate a discussion about growing up trans and the issues the documentary has explored uh, over the next hour. So I'm joined today by the acclaimed filmmaking team of Miri Navasky and Karen O'Connor. They spent more than a year making Growing Up Trans. Hi, Miri. Hi, Karen. Hello, Patrice and the, and the panel. Lovely to be with you. Uh, we're also joined by Christy Haggerty, and she is the mom of nine-year-old Leah, who was featured in last night's film. And Christy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be a part of the group. Um, and Dr. Rob Garofalo is, is here. He's with the Ann and Robert uh, H. Laurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. He was featured in the film last night, and he works very closely with transgender children. Dr. Garofalo, thank you for being here. Hi, thank you for having me. It's really an honor to be part of this project. And then we are also joined by Skylar Kurgel, who is a well-known YouTuber, a trans activist, and a musician who was just named one of the 11 transgender people who are shifting our views in 2015 by none other than BuzzFeed. He was also at the White House last week for President Obama's LGBT reception. So Skylar, thank you for joining us here as well. Thank you so much for having me be a part of this awesome conversation. And my colleague Caroline at Frontline is also here. She's helping me to field all of your questions today. We may not be able to get to all of them, um, but we'll cover as much ground as we can. And um, we're grateful to all of you for watching last night's documentary and for joining us for this important conversation. Uh, so for starters, uh, I have a question for, for you, Mary and Karen. Uh, so obviously, trans issues have really exploded into the mainstream in recent weeks and months. Uh, uh, with Caitlyn Jenner's debut, uh, but the two of you started exploring this territory long before um, it was in the headlines. Can you tell me a little bit about why you decided to focus on kids who were growing up trans for this documentary? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Mary and I did start kind of looking at this general territory about 18 months ago, somewhere around that period. We started to see various long-form articles appearing, New Yorker magazine, New York Times, Atlantic, and um, we were just curious, so we read more around the same time Mary has young kids who were starting in preschool to kind of think in more gendered ways, and so it just started to kind of be these constellations of forces and interests, and the more we read, the more we realized it had the potential to do what we like to do as filmmakers for Frontline, which is to go deep inside a world that you may have kind of heard about or thought you knew something about, but perhaps by going in and sort of spending some time in an intimate way, we might kind of bring something new to it. And I also, I just to add to that, we, we after reading things, we went online and saw blogs like Skylar Levin's blog and started looking at these kids who are chronicling their transitions in just these incredible children. And there were hundreds, if not thousands, of videos where kids had kind of created communities uh, online and started to realize there was this entire world out there that we you know, knew nothing about. Terrific, and and Christy, this you know the film is called Growing Up Trans, and it really uh, presents a look at what these kids are going through in their own voices. But it's also really a documentary about parents and the choices that they are making uh, with their children as well. So I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about sort of your your journey with Leah and and what it's been like um, and all the way up through the premiere of the documentary last night? That I don't have enough time for that. <laughs> That's a lot of information. That said. is a lot of that is a lot of information. But why did you decide to to share your story and Leah's story with Frontline? Well, it, 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 the reason why um, we, we as a family decided to be a part of this documentary was because 
our journey started due to the fact that someone else stepped forward and told their story. And, um, you know, our experience has been really kind of a blessing. We've been very fortunate, and our child has been able to, um, you know, transition at her own pace because of the community that we have around us. Um, but if it weren't for the person that came forward before me to share their child's story, um, to give me strength and to show me the way, you know, we might still be wondering what to do. And so that was the heart of why we joined the documentary. And, um, you know, um, I'm not sure what else, <laughs> you know, to go from there. Um, it's been a, a, a big year. Um, you know, Leah was very concerned with how she was going to be portrayed in this film um, as it was a year ago. And, and I said to her, you know, a lot's happened. And it's true. A lot has happened since, since Mary and Karen started filming. Um, and we're really proud with the way the film turned out and are confident that it, it will continue to help people. We know that it's helping people even in the last week as we've reached out and um, have already gotten lots of messages from people that said, you know, it's because of you guys coming forward that we have found a place in this community. So not sure if that was what you were looking for, but <laughs> Yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing. And and speaking of, of finding community and, and resources, um, Skylar, one of the one of the elements of the documentary showed how um, you know transgender teenagers, kids and teenagers are really finding the online space as a way to get first hand accounts um, from others who have gone through uh, different uh, stages of transitioning. And I, I know you began sort of documenting your process um, back in, in two thousand nine why did you decide um, to begin uh, to begin that process and and what has it been like for you to sort of share that with the world yeah so it is actually accidental I ran out of space on my computer to store all of the videos I was so excited to record my voice multiple times a day <laughs> and so I heard about YouTube just plopped them on there didn't really expect anyone to find them by any means and I guess that there was a need for um, for my story to be shared at that time. There were just a few other folks on there, and it really shaped the way that I've gone about my entire transition. I expected probably just to become a boy and live as a boy for the rest of my life, um, but the online community and the conversations I've had have really led me to continue to live out and open and to help um, mentor trans youth who vicariously also they help me too, which is fantastic. Great. And Dr. Garofalo, in, in your role at Lori, you're really intersecting with children at, and their parents at this very sort of emotionally fraught um, at time. And there's a, there's a moment in the documentary where, you know, you're talking with Kyle and, and, and you say something to the effect of, I'm going to have to ask you to be, you know, really grown up uh, very quickly as we, you know, as, as we think about it and make these decisions that can have sort of permanent lasting impact and I'm, I'm wondering how what drew you to sort of doing doing this work and having um, these difficult conversations and, and how long have you been working in this particular field? Um, I'm actually relatively new to the field of working with gender non-conforming children. I came at this field really from a background of doing HIV medicine so I did uh, care for HIV positive adolescents for many years and Unfortunately, uh, transgender women in particular are a community that are particularly hard hit by uh, sort of HIV. And so my experience with the transgender community was really older sort of transgender women that were finding themselves either at risk um, or, or actually acquiring HIV. It wasn't until I actually did a uh, television program, uh, I did Dr. Oz a number of years ago, and I actually thought that that segment was going to be on transgender adolescents. And, showed up and lo and behold there were these little children running around and I was like holy crap now now what am I gonna do and I'm a pediatrician and you know I, I think I rallied to the occasion and um, after that one family found me out on the internet and then two and then five and there I found other colleagues Joe Olson, Steve Rosenthal in LA and San Francisco who are doing this work who uh, recruited me to some extent and convinced me that this was important work that needed to be done so Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a natural evolution for me, but it's a population that I uh, care deeply about, and it's really an honor to be doing this work at this point in history for this particular community. 
Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, let's let's go to some of the questions from our social media audience. Uh, this is uh, we've we've seen a couple of questions along these lines from folks on Twitter and Facebook, uh, asking so you know saying these these families and kids that we saw in the documentary are you know they're navigating this and there's there's these resources available to them. What is you know what is it like for you know for working class uh, parents and families and low low income um, socioeconomic uh, families who have kids who are are struggling with gender identity and you know what resources are are available to them and um, and so what are the what are the costs of uh, of transitioning and are they prohibitive for um, for kids in some situations. I mean, I'll take a crack at answering that. I, I think, first of all, there's a misconception about the young people that were uh, in this particular documentary. At least the youth that were the young people that were featured in our uh, particular program really crossed the socio-demographic spectrum. I mean, these were not all families uh, that came from means. Um, you know, a number of these families were, were on, are on public aid or, you know, have received or, or have Medicaid. So I don't think that, at least in our program, um, these are services that only uh, populations of means can access. Mm -hmm. I mean, the costs can be um, sizable depending upon things like insurance coverage and whether insurance will cover the medications or the labs. I mean, even though I think things are progressively getting better, we still exist in a world where, you know, there are too often exclusions in people's insurance uh, coverage for gender-related issues. I honestly believe that, you know, that's going to be a thing of the past within three to five years. I mean, I think there, it's clear that there's a movement to change these things, but for right now, um, you know, the costs can be, you know, quite uh, ex extensive. I mean, the pubertal blocking medications, for instance, where they're not covered by insurance, you know, can be, you know, twelve to fifteen hundred dollars per month. Um, so the costs uh, can be quite um, exaggerated, I think. That said, I, I do think things are changing, um, and I don't want to give the impression that the youth that were featured in this particular film uh, were only uh, only came from communities um, uh, of means or of, of high socioeconomic status because that's not correct. I would also like to add to that. That's right. I think we took there. There it is an important <laughs> important point. There is more of a range of uh, socioeconomic um, backgrounds in the film than might otherwise be understood. So I appreciate that, Rob. And it, it was one of the reasons why we went to Chicago. Is they were they were patients from all different backgrounds economically, so. Unlike some other clinic programs across the country. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in our clinic as well, we have a good mix of even racial ethnic diversity, which I think is not always the case in some clinics. And I think it comes from the standpoint of our hospital, you know, Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital, really um, buying into this program from the get-go. So while we were, you know, kind of the new kids on the block to some extent, the hospital was deeply committed to the provision of care for these young people. And I think that's really made all the difference. And, and we also got media attention from the get-go, um, including a number of sort of newspaper articles, which I think helped um, families from across various communities know about our services and therefore access care with us. Mm -hmm. And up next, we have a question from Mariana Dale, and this is a question uh, for Christy. She's wondering, how do you handle knowing that the hormones that will help your child become themselves have limited research? Um, well, I think we are, you know, trying to be as thoughtful and, um, you know, our, our personal story is that we aren't in any hurry. Um, you know, we're, we're working with someone who is going to guide us very carefully along the path. We're not making any rash, hurried decisions. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that there, you know, are a lot of things that people can't predict. Um, however, you know, we have been told that taking the puberty blockers is going to allow for us to consider it that much longer and allow us to um, reflect and learn more as the whole world is learning more, uh, like Dr. Garofalo said, you know, um, 
So we're doing our best to learn for ourselves and be thoughtful of what our child's needs are and listen to what she wants. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think there are a lot of things that could come up <laughs> that we're not going to be able to predict in this scenario. So um, that that's really it. We're just trying to take it one step at a time and do what we can to know as much as we can and have faith that it will hopefully work out for the best. Mm -hmm. I think an important point to, to raise here is that while, yes, I think everybody who spoke to this in the film wants more of an evidence-based or a scientific basis to make these decisions, it's not as though these young people uh, and the parents are operating without a, at least some good historical context. So these medications have been used in other populations, used effectively without a lot of problems. Um, and they've also, there's a long history of anecdotal and historical use of these medications in, you know, transgender and gender nonconforming populations, again, with, you know, decent outcomes. The problem is that they haven't been done in the way the medical community might like as part of organized, like, randomized clinical trials or, you know, scientific, you know, there's not reams of scientific evidence. But I don't want anyone to think that these children or their parents are, are allowing their children to be con conducted as part of an, any sort of experiment, because that's not what we're talking about here. Right. Thank you. Up next, a uh, question for Karen and Miri. Uh, so in, in recent months, uh, it, it, we've seen uh, headlines around transgender adults and wider and wider acceptance. Um, it, I'm wondering when you began the process of, of making this film, how, uh, you know, sort of before this explosion of, of headlines, what was it like to, uh, to try to sort of build the trust of, of both the kids and the families uh, and the medical professionals that you were, you know, reaching out to to share their stories in, in such an intimate way? Uh, how, how did you sort of begin the process and find uh, people who were, who were so willing to sort of invite you in to their journey? Um, well, we knew we wanted to focus on kids, so that was a help just in terms of kind of narrowing the research a, a little bit. Um, we cast out very widely. It's one of the great luxuries that we get still at Frontline. It's one of the last kind of long-form documentary series around that still gives you time for research. So we got to know people and families long before we turned a camera on, which is extraordinarily helpful. And we cast out to support groups and parent groups and uh, clinics all across the country and then met with people all, all everywhere along the way, including we met Christy at a support group in Boston with Dr. Ellen Perrin. We met Rob in our first research trip in Chicago. We went to LA, went to Boston, and just sort of gradually word of mouth, person by person, kind of found our way. Yeah, and I think, uh, I, I, I think it was a mix of things. I mean, we... I think we started it actually, I think, two years ago, and what we found is from the beginning, these were families and kids that had spent an exorbitant amount of time thinking about these issues. And so, as you see in the film, this is an intensely articulate group of kids. <laughs> and I think as soon as we started talking, it was like, the, the floodgates opened. There was so much to talk about. And I, I felt like people wanted to share their stories. They, they wanted to, to talk about the, the complications and uh, their, the different journeys they had had, whether it was going stealth for a while, whether it was finding themselves on the Internet and finding Skylar 11 and going, you know, oh, that's what I am, whether it was, um, you know, Medications. It was at every angle we found um, an extreme openness. In fact, two years ago, Skylar, you and I, I think, first met, right, or talked on the phone. I mean, we we began this research process long before, and it was in conversations like Skylar that you realized, oh my goodness, this has the potential to be kind of taking people inside this world in a new way that I hadn't known or Mary hadn't known. So we we got lucky as well that families trusted us with their stories and kids like Skylar and all along the way um, saw this as an opportunity to tell their stories in a way that might potentially have real value for, for other people across the country. As Rob says at the end of the film, more and more families, and as Christy said, are coming out 
Um, they're coming out from the shadows and sort of feeling each month more and more families being prepared to kind of come forward and, uh, and tell their stories. So I think in that way we also benefited from the time as well. Yeah, so. I, I, I do remember one, um, you know, Ariel, actually a 13-year-old, telling us, like, she had seen all these films and she wanted it to be more real. She said yeah. she wanted, you know, kids to look at her as a kid in all of its, you know, complications. And so I think there was also, you know, a, de a desire on, on some of these kids' parts. To, to be respectful but to not idealize the experience and to, if we could, go in and kind of get close to it and all of its um, nuance and complexity that that was the kind of hope and fortunately families, doctors, everyone involved um, saw this as an opportunity to do that. So, Up next we have a question for Skylar. This is from Indigo Edwards who's wondering what advice do you have for young people who are questioning their gender identity? Well, I would say um, my advice would be to keep asking those questions of yourself and to also ask them of other people. If you have any support groups nearby, those are helpful. For me, the online community was extremely helpful. I didn't have many folks close to me. So asking others about their stories and their feelings and with within yourself and externally, um, the answers will come to you. It, for me, questioning was a well, I guess probably at least three active years of questioning, but if we started when I was three, then maybe like ten years of questioning. <laughs> it can be a long process, um, but for me, actually, questioning was one of the most exciting times. Hardest, but exciting. So ask the questions of yourself and seek help around you if you need it. Okay. Would any of uh, our other panelists like to weigh in on that? Advice for young people questioning their gender identity? No? I mean, sometimes young people do it best. I don't think you can <laughs> I don't think okay. you can add much to that answer. It's pretty perfect. OK, um, terrific. Uh, so moving on, uh, this is a question uh, from, oops, sorry, scrolling down right now. Uh, this is a question from Jen Burleton, and she's asking, how can we, who are not parents of trans kids, help build support for trans kids, especially if we don't actually know them? In other words, what resources could and should we share with teachers, schools, etc.? So, what are some of the what are some of the resources out there that folks can share? Well, I mean, I, and I don't know if Jen wants me to tell like what the needs are or what I know is out there, um, but I know that there's a need for more information. And you know, in my little world here, um, and our really lovely story where Leah has been able to to grow and learn and be who she is without too much trouble. Um, teachers in our community still are learning like they don't know enough. They're therapists that don't know enough to help us. So I know I can go to Boston, I can go to Portland, Maine, I can get online and find resources um, but I feel like it needs to be bigger and better than that. It needs to be more obvious and ready for people who may not have transgender children um, but want to be advocates for, for transgender children or gender variant or questioning children. I think it needs to be um, presented in, in a public way where it's accessible and it's part of a curriculum in schools, it's part of an understanding in a pediatrician's doctor's office that this is, as Dr. Graffel says, it's not going away. It's here, and so it needs to be a regular part of how we live our lives as humans. Um, mm -hmm. And that's my that's my take. <laughs> I think one of the things that our program didn't anticipate was the need for the kind of like integration in schools and in pediatrician offices. And when we started our program, when we sought funding, we we were, had the really good fortune of having a local foundation that gave us startup funds. Um, you know, we really focused on our clinical team, and yet I think by far, in some ways, the busiest person in our program is Jennifer Leininger, who's our program coordinator. Mm -hmm. And part of what she does is really go into schools and school systems and does so many trainings that, um, you know, many of these schools are really looking for. 
Um, and I think that that's, you know, slowly going to extend to other areas. You know, Christy pointed out, you know, pediatrician offices and, and medical communities. I think what you're going to see is just an increased integration of this type of care and concern for these kids, in part because they are changing the world in, in ways we could never even imagine. I mean, you know, Mary and Karen, you know, hats go, my hat goes off to you in, in terms of getting these young people and their families to be so raw and honest and candid. Um, about their experiences. I mean, I have just no doubt that um, that's going to open up a lot of hearts and minds. Okay, terrific. And uh, I apologize, I attributed that question to the wrong person. That was a question from Lucy McKean. Uh, up next, we're going to move on to a question from Mitchell Scuzzarella. Uh, and he, he said that he noticed some of the kids seem to move away from self-identifying as trans and seem to fully embrace their chosen gender. Do you think we're moving towards a time where trans will lose its identity with normalization? Um, an is interesting question. Skylar, love to hear what you have to say on that. Yeah, absolutely. That is a really interesting question because personally I started off just identifying as a man, dropped the trans, and then I very quickly, well by very quickly, I mean over a year, went back to identifying as a transgender man. I think twofold, it's got two aspects to it. One, if I add transgender onto it, um, for me as someone who passes as a man um, in society, it's important for me to tag the transgender along with that because um, without being visible, um, it's uh, <laughs> hard to educate. And so I like to, I like to add that on into conversations. But simultaneously, at the same time, for me, it helps me with my continuum of my story. For me, I don't feel like I want to change my birth certificate because I'm comfortable with the fact it says female on there. They announced I was female. I had no choice of it when I was born. So it goes. That's where I'm at in my journey. And so for me, in order for this continuum to continue, I feel that um, I'm a transgender man. It's, uh, the transgender is a part of my identity. However, that being said, is that I've got many friends who are just men, just women, and many that do choose to add the trans onto it. I think it goes in context with how someone sees their life. What I heard from a lot of these kids was, I identify as a boy or I identify as a girl, like really strong in their um, identity there, which is incredible. And I said the same thing when I was three years old. And now I've chosen to think of my transition in my life as one line, not born in the wrong body, not, you know, old life and new life, just one continuum. So I think it depends on how people see their lives, and I think it can change over time too, but I don't think it will be erased. Mm -hmm. And for those of you watching, uh, on our website, pbs.org slash frontline, we have an essay from Isaac, who's one of the teenagers who shares his story in the documentary, and he's uh, he also talks and is grappling uh, with this idea of gender uh, as a continuum. So that's worth checking out and reading on our website, pbs.org slash frontline. Um, if, if that's of interest. Uh, so up next we have a question uh, for Karen and Miri, but I think it's something Christy will also be able to, to speak to. This is from Lewis Fair, and he's saying, I noticed that I didn't see any siblings in the documentary. Is there a high preponderance of growing up trans singles, singletons? There really wasn't. I mean, some of it is just the time that we're given. We're trying to put so much into a film. Um, some of the kids were, were, were you know, only children. So, some of them had siblings. Uh, Christy certainly can speak to that. Um, I, I think it's, it, it, they, they, they were really all, some of them had two siblings, some of them had one sibling, some of them had no siblings, so they were really all over the place. And when we began, we thought we were going to have, you know, be able to get all these different perspectives in, and I think the sibling perspective is part two. It's so interesting. <laughs> Um, but we were just limited in how much we could we could fit into the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, the sibling story is uh, an important one because it's it's part of an evolution for an entire family, and especially even supportive families. You know, there's there's a lot that has to evolve for everyone to understand, accept, and and support. And um, our daughters, we have three, so um, Leah has two sisters, and she's in the middle. Um, and her sisters support her, and I think I know you know Daniel's story, you know as well, and and um, they are very much a part of their siblings' lives, and we're lucky to be able to say that. I know that that's not the case for everyone, um, but I think these younger children, um, siblings, if they're lucky to have them, um, can make a big difference for them. Okay, great. 
Uh, up next, we have a question from Deborah Geyer Cisco, and she uh, she asked her question on Facebook, and she was wondering: Are there going to be more studies on the long-term effects of puberty-blocking drugs and cross hormones? And I know Dr. Garofalo, you had already you know, touched on this uh, when discussing the body of research that is available. Uh, but I'm wondering: Do you see sort of coming down the pike uh, an increase in funding for studies uh, in this vein? Uh, this is a perfect question, actually, and perfect timing for this. Um, I'm pleased to be able to semi-report, although it's not 100% official yet, that mm -hmm. four sites uh, in the U.S., uh, Boston, Boston Children's Hospital, us at Lurie Children's, um, L.A. Children's Hospital, led by Joe Olson, Joanna Olson, uh, and UCSF, led by Stephen Rosenthal. So our four sites, it looks like, are almost certainly going to receive uh, NIH funding to conduct the first ever U.S. study looking at the long-term impact of pubertal blocking hormones and cross-sex hormones on these young people. So, you know, these are studies that previously have really only been conducted uh, in, you know, Europe um, and other parts of the world. And, you know, where I think it's important to conduct these studies in the U.S. is not only to fully understand some of the medical consequences, but the social context in which these medications are used in the U.S. may be quite different. So it's an exciting time for this field. I would look for these studies to hopefully hit the ground um, by the fall, and hopefully by mentioning it as part of a Google Hangout. The NIH now has no choice but to fund us. I'm not sure if that's considered blackmail or strong <laughs> I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not you know, above that. That's big news, Rob. That's very big news. Uh, it's really, um, it was a labor of love, I think, for all four doctors. You know, Norman Spack, the doctor in Boston, has really been the father of some of this work over the years. I mean, so I think these four sites really came together and kind of gave the NIH no choice but to do the right thing. <laughs> All right, and then Jessica Brand asks, as someone who's featured in a documentary about transitioning teens coming out next year to public release, what advice would you suggest that most would not realize? How did it change your life, you know, being filmed, the documentary's release, et cetera? So I think this is a question um, for Christy. Obviously, we're just, the, the premiere was just last night, um, and, but also for you, Skylar, because you've been, you putting your story out there and documenting it uh, yourself as well. So let's start with Christy. Yeah, I think um, that's a great question and it, good, good for you for thinking that far ahead um, because it, it is something that you need to be aware of. Um, and in the last week, you know, I was part of an article that came out on NBC and, um, it, it, you know, it shakes things up a little bit and, you know, there are critics everywhere and there's a lot of love and support that's been coming our way in the last few days, but um, I went on Facebook very quickly on Friday and shut down my public posts, um, sadly, but um, to really try to contain some of the craziness that happens, and, and you need to be prepared for that because, um, you know, the world is a big place when you get out onto media and social media and it can get away from you very quickly. So that would be my, that's my most immediate reaction to that question. And um, I think, you know, just be, be prepared for, for, I think, a lot of support and, and you're doing the right thing and thank you for being a part of it as well. Mm -hmm. and, and Skylar, for you. Yeah, I would agree with what Christy said. Um, definitely being prepared for the opportunities that, that come your way. For me, it's been life-changing in that I get invited, you know, two months of the year I spend traveling around to different high schools and colleges to do um, programming and education and music, which is extraordinary, but I've also said no to a lot of opportunities that to me um, seem like they wouldn't be authentic. So never be afraid to say no, because someone's like, hey, you know, this is really exciting, like trans is trending, as they put it. Um, so it is okay to say no if, if it's an opportunity you don't want to take, but simultaneously as well, you know, the internet's full of people with opinions and um, my advice is to read every positive supportive comment twice like read it and let it really sink into you just let it like let yourself feel the butterflies and the joy and the excitement and the you know I'm thinking about one I read today that's just making me almost tear up and so do that read them twice like if you need to print them out and put them on your wall do that because whenever you interact with something negative remember that you 
literally could, I mean, you probably did save someone's life, and that's the, one of the most extraordinary things you can do. So thank you for being uh, vulnerable and being a part of whatever this exciting uh, documentary that hopefully we get to see is. Um, so speaking of social media and, and comments on social media, both good and bad, um, we've, there's been a number of studies on, on the bullying and um, some of the sort of social harassment that kids who are trans uh, face. And I know 19 states and Washington, D.C. have um, statutes on the books uh, against uh, bullying, gender, gender identity-based bullying. I'm wondering, you know, in, in your experience, um, Christy, as, as the parent, of, of a kid who is transitioning, Skylar, in, in your experience, um, sharing your transition online, um, what have you run up against? Do you feel like there's been uh, a shift in, in the past couple months or past couple years? Um, and is that something that you've faced in your daily lives? Um, so maybe, Christy, we'll start with you. Um. Yeah, you know, personally, I have not been bullied. We've been really overwhelmingly supported, um, and so I'm grateful for that. I know it exists, and, and Leah has had experiences at school um, that haven't been groundbreaking in any way. She's a strong kid, a competent kid, and has been able to pull through it, but she's aware that kids will ask questions and, and, and um, treat her differently maybe than she thinks they would if, if she wasn't a trans kid, you know? Um, so I think, you know, the importance around being able to have people to talk to and communicate with and know, like Skylar says, to really focus on the good feedback and the friends that you know you have. You know, my husband and I have really paid attention to the community that we've found especially on Facebook, um, you know, it's those little likes that mean so much to people who put themselves out there in whichever capacity. Those little messages that we get um, really help to push away, you know, any negativity and bullying. So, um, and then on the proactive end of it, you know, we're doing all we can as parents to promote education and I think that that is what kills fear and kills bullying because the more people know the less they can break down and beat up on you know and um, I think knowledge is power so that's sort of my stance on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, just to chime in is that uh, my parents had such concern when I started putting videos online about the bullying that I would receive and especially as a 17 year old really insecure facing bullying at home to some degrees facing some bullying at school to some degrees they just figured you know now you're opening up to the whole world being able to um, be negative at you and while it's been really hard and I've been bullied off of some some sites like in fact the site Tumblr I found to be extremely unsafe um, for trans youth especially um, not for me, but for the trans youth I was talking to. So I found safer spaces. Um, like Facebook tends to be, people hold themselves more accountable. There seems to be less um, harassment on there, at least that I've experienced. Um, but on YouTube can also be anonymous as well. I find that in the anonymous places, the bullying can happen. The most important thing to know, um, at least uh, I guess advice for myself, is that being online is a choice, and reading the comments are a choice, and responding to them are a choice. And what I tend to find is if someone says something that's just pure hateful and there's no room for education, why continue the conversation? Just delete. No one else needs to see that. Bye bye Gone. <laughs> like, sorry, your opinion's not welcome. <laughs> but in any case, um, if there's room for education, like such as someone misuses a term or says something um, that doesn't really seem hateful, maybe it's more ignorant, sometimes I like to continue that conversation, turn it from something that could have been uh, aggressive and bullying into being like, oh, did you really mean to say this? Like, let's talk about that. And sometimes that can be really successful. But bullying and social media can be really hard. But overall, I find that it's, it's worth having social media because of how much it can help uh, kids across the country and the world. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Garofalo, are there sort of specific resources um, that, that you offer at Lurie and at other gender clinics around the country um, in terms of the mental health aspects of transitioning and providing you know, support for, for kids who are being bullied for what they're experiencing? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure of any program that has specific sort of anti-bullying components. I mean, I think most uh, clinics across the country that are beginning to do this work, and, and I say that because like five years ago, there were maybe like five places, you know, and 
I think my last count, there were almost 30, you know, and not a week goes by almost, or certainly not a month goes by, that I don't get a call from another colleague at another institution that sees a documentary like this or reads a story and says, you know what, I should be doing this work in Indiana or in Wisconsin or in Iowa. So that's fabulous. I, I do think in general the approach has been a much more global approach around, you know, mental health in general. I mean, really, I think that's another misconception around sort of the medical care. I mean, really what we're doing in programs like ours and in programs like ours across the country is providing parents and young people the tools that we would provide any young person or any parent to raise their child in an environment that fosters, like, healthy childhood development. So, I, again, I mean, I think the general principles for overall mental health care are things that um, hopefully will help protect by uh, young people and certainly give parents the tools to help protect their children um, should in fact bullying occur. But specific anti-bullying programs that occur within the context of the medical community, I'm not aware of, but it's certainly uh, hopefully something we won't need. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to also jump in from what we saw at, um, you know, at uh, Dr. Ed's program was that when kids were having problems in school, they have a whole mental health department there as part of their clinic. They were talking to the doctors about it. Everything and about everything. Yeah, they were. They would go into the schools. They would talk with the school providers. They were. They were helping these kids navigate through, you know, tough stuff. So, you know, there might not be particular anti-bullying there, but I felt it in everything you guys do. I have to say. Yeah, I mean, and you never, I mean, I think my approach, and this has been true of my approach with HIV positive youth and adolescents in general, has been a sort of multidisciplinary angle, right? So in our program, every uh, young person that comes through our program has both uh, a physician as well as a mental health provider. So each child sees in, in a one-stop shop sort of a multidisciplinary care team. And why I think that's important is that you don't know when you're a young person who you may connect to. So... You know, it could be the physician that a young person connects to. It could be their therapist. It could be Jen Leininger, our program coordinator. We have parent support groups. We have, you know, adolescent support groups. We try to offer a range of services that not only provide young people the opportunity to access care, but even then when they're within our care, should issues arise, there are multiple opportunities to explore how to sort of correct um, or um, care for things. We're seeing a lot of comments and questions about uh, the role of parental support uh, for, for kids who are transitioning or questioning their gender and considering transitioning. Um, Jennifer Moran on Facebook is wondering, you know, what happens to kids who don't have support from their parents in this process? And, and she brings up um, high rates of homelessness and, uh, and suicide. Miri and Karen, in, you know, in the research that you were doing in, in the making of this film um, and the outreach you were doing when lining up families to talk with, did you, um, did you encounter, um, what, what did you encounter in terms of research on sort of outcomes and the possible role of, of parental support? I don't know that we found research specifically on the role of parental support. There is, you know, from the studies that we've seen, I think there's a 41% suicide rate. It's an older study uh, among transgender youth. I assume some of that has to do with support and non-support. Rob, you might know more. more about that. But I think what the point in our film is you do see a range of parental support in the film, and I think in the ways that we could, we are trying to kind of show a range of experience in there. And I think intuitively, instinctively, we are, you do feel in every way what a difference it makes um, at every turn to have, have support. That said, we also wanted at the film to take another step, which is to look at what it means even when you have parental support, that you're not spared also some struggles and difficulties, and that in some way not to discount the importance of that other piece of the story, but that we thought there was also something to be gained by going in and looking at the way in which the experience is actually universal, whatever the degree, that you you still have your own struggles. I'm, I'm kind of curious to know, I, it was hard to tell from the film, I'm assuming that all these kids were in schools, and I don't know whether they're public or private, but I thought that was interesting too because, you know, I find that... Um, the support of the school system and, and is so key 
for many kids. And I've had, in my experience, I did the TEDx talk, you know, a year or so ago, and I've had multiple teachers um, come to me and say, you know, what can I do for this child who I, I recognize is not being supported at home? And, you know, I tell them, like, you, you do all you can for this kid when they're with you because you might be their lifeline. And, um, you know, you can't discount that those few hours you might have with a child who needs you so much because they aren't getting it from the people that they should be. So, you know, I think the, the school systems, um, whether they be aftercare or, you know, you know, a restaurant, a local restaurant. Uh, you know, it's it's a miracle the the little people in your lives that can have such a huge impact on you if you can put yourself there to be available to those kids. Yeah, I I have to say we saw in a couple of years. I mean, I do have three kids in school, so I've seen the New York system, but the schools are changing so quickly. I, some of these kids weren't they were on school. Some of them were in public. Some of them were in private. But we're, we are definitely seeing, I, I think we saw in our research, just the transformation that was going on school to school to school. I think, uh, Rob, I don't know, it seems like Jennifer does a lot of work with schools in Chicago. and it. it seems yeah, like I mean, again, I, I mentioned it earlier. I mean, it was an aspect of our program that we actually didn't even anticipate, right? You know, so when we designed our program and we had the good fortune of being able to design it, you know, we really focused on the clinical components and then realized rather quickly through an incredibly talented program coordinator that really, you know, a lot of our needs were going to be, uh, you know, around larger family issues. You know, I often say, in our, or, or school system issues, you know, often I say when I'm treating uh, children and other aspects of my practice, the child is the unit of intervention. Uh, but when you're working with gender non-conforming or transgender children, it's often the family that is the unit of sort of, you know, intervention or care, you know, because it's really the family dynamics that are so important. I mean, you mentioned, you know, parental support. We know that parental support is hugely uh, important and impactful. And um, I think you saw in this documentary, it was painful for, you know, some of us on our team to watch, you know, the Blanchard family struggle you know, with issues around that, and I give them tremendous credit for sharing their story with uh, America, really. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I, I mean, one of the things that I, I wanted to say is I'd love to see Miri and Karen do a follow-up uh, story five years from now on where these kids are going to be, because I can tell you that even in one year, you know, some of these kids that looked like they were struggling are now thriving, um, and uh, that's going to be a really huge, important part of the story. Well, happily, Rob, you'll know our executive producer, Rainey Aronson, has already asked about that, and Miri and I are in. If all the families are in and you guys were in as well, because I think that it'll be tremendously just valuable and interesting, and it's just, it would be incredible. I mean, I obviously can't speak for all these families, but look at how these kids and these families gave of themselves for this story. I can't imagine that they wouldn't be open to, you know, that sort of follow-up dialogue. Um, I'd also just like to add that the other thing we were struck by, moved by, stunned by was the importance of not only parental support but peer influence. I mean, you see in this uh, film, and Skylar, you can talk about your own experience, what a difference it makes for Ariel to have those friends or for Alex to have the friends he has. And I'm sure, Christy, you have the same with Leah. I mean, it's, it's just in every way, I think, um, shapes and forms so much and I think we're starting our sense was there is also this generational shift going on where kids are um, kind of embracing this in a way that wasn't probably possible for kids not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Well asking if there was going to be a follow-up to this documentary that was going to be my last question <laughs> for, for you Mary and Karen because we're seeing a lot of questions uh, from folks on social media saying they're now invested in the stories that they saw unfold last night and they want to know you know they want to know what happens Is, are there any updates um, that you can give us we've heard from Christy on um, on on Leah but are, are there any major updates um, from anyone else featured in the film uh, that you'd be able to share well, Rob may add his own, and um, we, we've talked to uh, Kyle Catrimbone, has mm -hmm. been on testosterone now for, I think, what, a few months, Rob? He's yeah. thriving, he's doing well, he's gone to a new school, he's done tremendously well. John Blanchard, whose dad did come on board, by the way, and is now 
-hmm. I think even calling him John and, and making real efforts, John, um, I'm told, is doing extraordinarily well. Again, Rob would probably know more. Um, Alex, according to his mm -hmm. mom, also thriving, happy, doing well. Uh, Ariel is, we spoke to her the other day and she was participating in a radio interview just uh, blossoming <laughs> and um, thrilled with her with her life right now. So so far, uh, Isaac also wrote an amazing essay, as you said on the website. He's um, just incredibly bright and thoughtful and reopening his you know rethinking in all sorts of ways, gender and identity and what it means to be a trans man in this new world of 2015. Yeah, right. And Leah Hodson is thriving and um, just. So far, so good from all, all our reports, but Rob, you may have more current updates. I don't know. I mean, no, I think you sort of nailed it. I saw Kyle and his family last week and was, you know, pretty blown away by the change uh, in this young man. And, uh, you know, yeah, of all the scenes in the documentary, I think for me that was the hardest to watch, is to hear Kyle talk about how close he came to... Um, either attempting or considering suicide. You know, as his as his doctor, that was so difficult for me to watch. And then I, you know, I have the good fortune to be able to say that I saw him last week, and then to know that he is like thriving and succeeding, and I'm like tearing up as I talk to you um, on this Google Hangout. But it's it's really quite remarkable, and um, I look forward to that follow up uh, documentary because it it will be equally as powerful as this one. Wonderful. All right, and we'll, we're, we'll circle over to a question. Uh, this is from Peter Jacobson, and he's wondering, um, are there more young trans men than there are women? Is there any sense of whether there's a difference in the numbers of trans men versus trans women who are looking into blockers or hormones? Just curious about the numbers. So, Dr. Garofalo, would you, is there, is it evenly split? Is there a spread, or is it still about? This is, this is a question that um, I'm going to refrain from answering with any specificity, because <laughs> I actually will say that I don't think we really know. Okay. Um, I think that each of the clinics, including ours, has, a, has trends in sort of one direction, and I even hate using that term or the other, you know, I, but I don't think there are enough good sort of population-based epidemiological studies done to really know. So I think uh, what we'd be talking about is really an access to care issue and issues that relate to stigma and who presents to care. I'm not sure we'd actually be talking about prevalence of these communities in the population. Okay. Um, Terrific. Well, we are, we're, we're getting close. We'll have one more uh, audience question and then a wrap-up question for, for everyone on the call. This is a question um, from Jerome E. on Twitter, and he's wondering, are these kids who are, are transitioning, will they need to take uh, puberty-blocking medication for the rest of their lives? Um, so yeah, we're seeing a lot of questions on our on social media about sort of the logistics of the medication and the longitude of treatment. So again, Dr. Garofalo. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> so I mean, the reality is, I mean, you can't stay on puberty blocking hormones forever. You know, that would be sort of like Peter Pan syndrome to some extent. At some point, the idea is to um, you know initiate you know either a cross sex hormone or a sex hormone of some um, of some variety. The reality is, though, that for some individuals, the, the cross-sex hormones or the hormones that we use come with their own side effects. So um, for a lot of places, uh, they may try to keep the pubertal blockers on board, and this is a little bit more technical than it needs to be probably for this Google Hangout, but um, you can potentially, for some populations, keep those medications on board for at least a little while. I'm not sure that we have any long-term follow-up studies to see if they would be used lifelong. They're certainly not... Um, it's not the way they're typically used. They would have a relatively uh, short half-life. We think of them as you know, being a pause button that we would use for a certain period of time until the initiation of a sex hormone. Okay. And for our final question, um, Skylar, we'll start with you on this one. But we've talked about uh, where, where these kids will be potentially as individuals in the next five or ten years. And hopefully we'll have the chance to, to follow that again. Uh, but in terms of society as a whole, Skylar, where do you think 
where do you see uh, things going in terms of trans issues, and where do you think we'll be um, ten years from now? Oh wow, that's um, a big question. That's a, that's a big question. Well, I mean, I came out in about two thousand seven, so about uh, eight years ago now. Um, oh, it feels like longer than that. But in any case, the shift that I've seen in just these past eight years has been incredible. Um, to hear the word transgender on the street, both um, an exciting thing and slightly terrifying as it brings it into the general population and uh, the general population can do what they what they may with it. Um, but I feel that with the public, much more public knowledge about trans issues, um, I'm seeing way much more acceptance than um, I saw when I came out, way more conversations about it. So I imagine that in 10 years, um, when someone comes out, if coming out is still a thing as their gender <laughs> or as trans, um, I think that hopefully it will be, oh, all right, well, tell me what that means to you and what can I do to help, you know, just as simple as that, as simple as when I learned something new about one of my friends. So that's that's the way that I'm seeing it, but there's a lot of politics that need to be accomplished, a lot of laws um, need to be put in place to protect us, to protect our youth and to protect our adults, and I think once we get that shift really going and society shifts, then hopefully smooth sailing. <laughs> and Christy, any predictions from you? I'm mute. Um, I, I'm really hopeful that um, it, it's going to continue to progress, like Skylar said, in a positive way where there's room for everyone to be human. <laughs> Ultimately, I think that's what I've learned the most from this experience with my child is, you know, I'm hoping that Skylar can be Skylar and that Leah can be Leah, ultimately. That we don't have to make it as much of a conversation about trans men, trans women, gender variant, you know, the in-between. I think, you know, ultimately, hopefully society and humanity will come to understand each person for exactly who they are and who they want to be. That's, that's my hope. And I, and I think we're going in the right direction. We're making the right move. So that's my take. <laughs> uh, well, Christy, Karen, Miri, Dr. Garofalo, and Skylar, thank you guys all so much for joining us here today. It was great to connect with all of you. Uh, thanks to all of you who watched and asked questions. Uh, the documentary Growing Up Trans is available for free and full online anytime. You can watch it at pbs.org slash frontline. Thank you all for being here today and sharing your stories. We look forward to next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all.